We're sitting down with Richard Titus, the interim president of Transform Group, a blockchain conglomerate. Thank you for sitting down with us today, Richard. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, so I'm curious about your professional career starting from the beginning. <laughs> In my rock and roll past. So I, uh, I grew up with two parallel loves. One was music. Uh, I love music and I played cello, bass, guitars, I sang, I was in a bunch of bands, I was vaguely famous for about 15 minutes. Uh, and because I was born at a, at a very particular time, there was something called MIDI, which is Musical Instrument Digital Interface, which was this technology that allowed you to communicate a synthesizer or a keyboard with your computer. So as a hobbyist, I spent a lot of time playing with this. And when my band was dropped on my 18th birthday, I decided to go to college. Uh, I dropped out of five or six of them. And in the process, I set up my first startup, which built recording studios for aging rock stars and professional songwriters, mostly in Santa Barbara, but uh, all over the West Coast. Um, I built studios for the Beach Boys, Kenny Loggins, Christopher Cross, lots of other, uh, all these very famous guys who live in the Santa Barbara area. And one of those people, Bruce Johnson, was a uh, one of the Beach Boys, uh, and I became quite close. And their keyboard tech left to join Atari Computers as their music guy, and they had a job open. And he offered me to go on tour with them, initially as a keyboard tech, but eventually as a sound engineer. Um, and from that, I ended up mixing the very last record the band ever recorded as a band called Summer in Paradise, which incidentally was the first record recorded on Pro Tools. Great. And you spent some time on the road with them. Yeah. Uh, what, what's life like on the road as a musician? It's funny. So I, I always say that people should either join the military or join a rock and roll band or in some way, you know, the Peace Corps, some way to go out there and experience the world when you're young and you can do this. And I've had some crazy adventures. Uh, living in hotels and flying on jets every day was, was really transformative for me in terms of understanding both how big and how small the world is. What were some observations you made about the Beach Boys at that point in their careers? The Beach Boys or the world? Uh, <laughs> The Beach Boys. Yeah. So it's interesting. I, I'm very grateful to them because they really exposed me to a lot of the world at a very young age. They took a bet on someone who is 20 years younger than the next youngest crew member. Um, at the same time, while I really enjoyed working with them, you know, they were very, very successful. They were on the declining edge of their careers in many ways. And watching the sort of inner scene politics within the band was fascinating because you know, these guys grew up together. Um, and they, they could be very difficult em employers. They were also just very magnanimous and very giving, and so it was interesting to watch the delta amongst all the band members of sort of good and bad. But for the most part, for me, it was a very good experience. What are some of the uh, memories that stand out on the road with them? Or One of my favorite memories, uh, uh, it was the first Earth Day concert, and we were recording the record, so we were at a man named Terry Melcher, who was Doris Day's son, who was the producer of the album, at his house in Carmel. And uh, we were, I was living actually at Doris Day's hotel at that time, uh, which is the hotel in Carmel. And I would go up to the studio early and get all the gear running. It was the first record I reported on Pro Tools on a hard drive, and so it took a bit of setting up every day. And the phone rang, and Mike Love was downstairs meditating. Now, meditating today is very common, but at that time, I didn't know anyone who meditated, and, and actually they had introduced me to this idea. We'll come back to that later. And so Mike is downstairs meditating, and so I answer the phone. And a British man says, hello. And I said, hello. And he said, yeah, so let's talk to Mike or Bruce. And I said, can I ask who this is? And he said, it's Paul McCartney. And I dropped the phone. Yeah, <laughs> so because, you know, Paul McCartney, literally just direct dialing, not through an assistant. And I picked up the back phone. He said, are you there? And I said, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, uh, one second. Uh, and he kind of laughed, struggled, right? So I went and got Mike and broke, stopped him from meditating, which is usually a big no-no. But I figured for the Beatles, probably all right. He, of course, told me he'd call him back. Wow. <laughs> so I had to go back and tell Paul that he would call him back. So he, he did call him back. And later, when we played uh, in Rio at the Earth Day performance, Paul walked over to me. And he said, are you in the chap in the studio? <laughs> and he introduced himself. He was so magnanimous. It was such a, I'll never forget that moment. It was like one of those moments of meeting one of your greatest idols of your life, and he was just laughing at me. Yeah, wow. What were some of the challenges using Pro Tools at that point? Well, so we were using beta hardware, beta software. Nothing worked. Uh, you know, the, the story of Pro Tools is I had an early beta. I had been in the music business by this time for a while, and I had a lot of contacts. And I would gotten a beta copy of the 4-track version for my Mac. Um, and I was a big computer nerd. I had three computers in my house. I was very comfortable. Linux, Unix, whatever. But this only ran on a Mac, and it was really buggy. But I thought it would be an interesting tool to do the editing part of the album. So versus recording the album officially, I just wanted to do like the tape editing, splicing. And I showed that to the Beach Boys, and they got a little too excited. 
and they decided we were going to record the whole record. So we were literally the first people, and we had a DAT machine running. You probably don't even know what that is. In those days, there were these digital tape decks called DAX, digital uh, something tape. And they were running 24-7 in the studio, always recording things, because the system would crash and come back up and we'd lose the track. And so, but on the flip side, using technology that was so bleeding edge, you just knew you were part of the future. Today, everything is recorded on. Pro Tools are one of its successor programs. And uh, so there's lots of critique about digital recording methods when compared to like uh, historical analog recording methods. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Do we lose anything uh, with, through the digital process? Well, it's really interesting. So when, on that record, actually, we went to, and I'm not going to name names, I think I might be breaching confidentiality, but we went to a bunch of the preamp manufacturers. In those days, there were big recording consoles. The way you recorded a record, you had a tape machine, which were impossible to manage if you travel. And we, we recorded that record all over the world. So not doing it on a hard drive would have been impossible because everyone had guest houses and no one wants to travel. But we, all these mixing consoles, Neve, uh, Mackie, all these ones had a certain sound to them. And so I would tear the, the preamp channels out of the boards and build a custom board to record with. And eventually a couple of those companies went on to use some of that IP to build custom products for recording studios. So in many ways we've blended digital and analog. But you know, I do think there's a difference. Um, and, may, and interestingly, later in my time in the music business, we used to put record scratches back into digital recordings to make mm. them feel more warm and more mm. alive. Oh, wow, that's fascinating. Um, so you mentioned that you had sort of these dual kind of lives as a musician um, or being in the music industry and also as a technologist. Mm -hmm. How do you synthesize these two interests? Well, it's funny. I, when I was a very young man, my dad was in the defense industry, and so we had computers very early. Um, and I was on the internet much earlier than most people. But I considered the internet and computers my playground and music my vocation. And it's almost 30 years ago now I got sober, and I, I realized that my primary vocation was kind of not going to work with my sobriety. Mm. And the only fungible skill I had was that I knew a lot about computers. I actually didn't realize at the time how much I knew about computers. I was re easily 20,000 hours ahead of everyone else. Um, and I have particular knowledge around network operations, which was at that time very nascent. And so I ended up working in video games and eventually starting an internet company called Tag Media. But really, I view music as the primary driver for teaching me how to think about things in a unique and very powerful way that I wouldn't have learned if I just learned traditional, uh, uh, traditional education. It's fascinating. And so after you transitioned from the music industry into technology, what were some of your first experiences? I know you spent some time in the media industry. Okay. Uh, but what was your kind of first job uh, used, leveraging the internet? So the first bridge job, uh, so when I got sober, I left the music business and I was employed for like six months. And I was occasionally an IT guy who would get hired by record executives to sneakily attach their computers to the internet in violation of their company IT policy. So I, got very, I was a hacker, so I was very good at that. One of them at Capitol Records used to pay me only in free records, so I have almost the entire Capitol Records catalog in my house in CDs, of course, which is not worth anything anymore. But... Uh, Eventually, a guy named Jed Weintraub, who's still one of my dearest friends, offered me a job working with him on a video game. Because um, I knew a lot about digital audio recording and we were going to use digital video in this and he thought it was kind of interesting. And the first game we started working on was called Soldier Boys and we hired a young director who lived in Venice, California that we both knew from university named Darren Aronofsky. Hmm. Darren, of course, went on to make mm -hmm. Pie, Requiem for a Dream, Black Swan, and he's probably top ten directors in Hollywood now. Mm. Yeah, wow. And, uh what, uh, what was that like? It was amazing. So in those days, the video game, it, again, just like music, technology had suddenly, in the old days of video games, you had to have armies of developers working for years and years and years to build a quality video game. And suddenly, with the rise of CD-ROM, the rise of multimedia production, we made a streaming video shooter. That doesn't really mean anything anymore, but it was basically branching video on a very primitive engine with guns. Mm -hmm. So we sent Darren to the Philippines to shoot over and over and over, people getting shot and kind of broken storylines. Mm. That's actually where we Pi was on the set of the project he worked on oh, for wow. us. But what was amazing is we made that game for probably the marketing budget of most gaming companies. And we also made a game called Blue Heat, which was very famous because it was almost banned by Congress because of Tipper Gore found it offensive. It had naked women and it was a Playboy co-production. Mm. And, uh, you know, I did a little reading about your past and you, you worked a lot in the media industry, which is something that I'm interested in. Later, yeah. There's been a, 
What, so before you transitioned to the media mm -hmm. and after the video games, what were some of the other... Uh... So I left the movie company, and it was funny actually, I went to them and asked them for an investment because I wanted to start an early stage internet company and they turned me down. Mm. And so my partner and I decided to start it without them. And so we, instead of what we were going to do, we started a service firm to build websites, thinking we would use that money to fund our idea. Our idea wasn't a very good idea, and instead the service firm became what's called Razorfish today. It's one of the biggest agencies in the world. And we did that for a number of years. We got rolled up among a couple of other agencies. We went public. We made a lot of money. Market crashed. We lost most of it. Um, I left there in 2002 and started its biggest competitor, which was then called Schematic. It's now called uh, Possible. And we built that business over seven years. And at the time I got married, and my, my then wife was a film producer, sort of famous. She worked on both Independence, movie, Independence Day, The Patriot, eventually Godzilla. And we decided to set up a production company and make films. And so I was still chairman of the board of Schematic, and then I began making movies. The most famous movie I ever made was called Who Killed the Electric Car, which is a documentary about the EV1, and subsequently about Tesla and all of the electric cars. And my wife and I moved to Eastern Europe to shoot a slate of five films back to back. Uh, began to separate, went out divorced. Um, the films didn't go very well. And we ended up moving to London for post production, but we needed jobs. So I went to go, a friend of mine was moving to London to become the head of digital for the BBC named Eric Huggers. And he and I had lunch to brainstorm and catch up. And he's like, oh, you should come work for me for a few months. Three years later, uh, I've been at BBC, basically running all the consumer product part of the digital there. What was your main focus at the BBC on a day-to-day -day basis? So I started working on user experience uh, and design, which is really, at the BBC, and this is early uh, internet services w way of thinking about models. So when Eric joined the BBC, they had four divisions. They had news, they had vision, which was video, and they had ra audio and music and radio, which was the radio division, and then us, which was feature media and technology. And we were theoretically a service organization. They didn't use the web as a platform yet. And so we spent a bunch of time helping transform the organization to think about digital as part of everyone's DNA. We launched iPlayer, the mobile service. iPlayer is the first VOD service before Hulu, before Netflix, before anything. Uh, we launched uh, the mobile service, which at that time was BlackBerry. Uh, we rebuilt the homepage as a customer. Like sort of the way homepages are today, we were the first customized homepage. We kind of blew people's minds when we did that and really transform the organization culturally to really think about digital first, if you will. Um, and that was really the thing I was most proud of. And then I was headhunted away from there by a man named Lord Rothamere, whose grandfather invented the newspaper to run all the digital activities of the Daily Mail. Um, and that was also just like the opposite experience, but a phenomenally interesting, amazing experience. Um, working in you know, proper digital media, or proper media and, and newspaper, in London, which is like the heart of the news industry, even today. Like Fleet Street is still like that, that culture is still pervasive across all news media and all reporting. So, so you mentioned um, uh, personalized or, um, yeah, personalized uh, homepage experiences. Mm -hmm. So that refers to that somebody has lands on, say, bbc.co.uk. So I want to give you an idea. Like when I joined the BBC, their homepage had 113 links on the homepage, which were hierarchically ranked by how powerful the executives were that were in charge of the program. So not alphabetical, not organized anyway, and a random picture on the upper right. And it looked like a website from the 80s, but this is in, yeah, yeah. much later. And there were, I, I held a meeting in my first week of the job and I said, look, we're gonna, we're gonna have to change this. It's pretty terrible. So let's have a meeting. Everyone who's, who thinks they have you know, a voice or something to say about the homepage come to this meeting. I'm expecting like 10, 20 people. You know, like 80 people show up for the meeting. <laughs> and I was like, I sat in the, we were like an auditorium and I said, all right, I've been here for a week. Most of you don't know who I am. You'll figure it out. 80 people cannot do anything. So I need two groups of five executives. I'm gonna pick one and I'm gonna be one. One's going to be in charge of product, and one's going to be in charge of editorial, and we're going to transform bbc.co.uk by Christmas. And everyone's like, well, he's, he's not going to last. This won't work. And I said, that's great. I'm leaving because I, I can't pick the people. I don't know who any of you are. Self-select. But trust me, if there's more than 11 people in that room, I'm going to kick someone out. And I don't care how high-ranking they are. So, of course, the next week meeting, there were 12 people in the room, and I chucked out Peter Horks, who was the head of news. <laughs> we're actually really good friends now, but he was not happy about it. Yeah. That's great, and uh, well, you know, customizable homepages, uh, like, uh, what, what other sort of elements, because what other sort of elements? So, like, oh, so what I was going to answer the question was, this, this is a really revolutionary idea culturally for the BBC. The BBC had a view of, we tell you what the news is. 
the fact is, is I don't care about British sports. At that time, I didn't. I care about other things. So I wanted to move around. I wanted to change my weather. I wanted to set my location to have the weather tell me, you know, England's a very big country with lots of microclimates. Uh, I might want podcasts at the top. I might not want them at all. And in those days, media companies, they had what they had. It wasn't customizable. There was a very, very heavy laden process, and no one thought of the user first. This idea we have today of user experience, which Razorfish helped invent, was still very nascent. Like this idea of centering an experience around a user was not thought of. It was like, we're a newspaper, we're giving you info, you'll take it how we give it to you. Mm -hmm. And now I think media companies particularly have a much deeper relationship with their customer because of the thinking that we laid out in those early days, both at the Daily Mail and at the BBC. So you uh, transitioned to Daily Mail. Mm -hmm. What were your responsibilities with the Daily Mail? I was the chief executive. So I ran uh, all the digital businesses, which ranged from the online newspaper to all the classifieds. Um, classifieds is actually a funny term. People don't think about it. So just like the newspaper where all the money comes from, <coughs> advertising, you know, the newspaper, the, the car listings, it's the same thing online. So they early on bought big job boards, motor, automotive, used car, automotive, property, dating, um, not just in the UK, but around the world. <coughs> and all those businesses reported up to me. And we spent a bunch of years, when I joined, it was losing money, and when I left, it was very, very profitable. What were, <coughs> what were some of the main challenges you faced? Uh, I think there, the biggest challenge was cultural. Um, each of these businesses had a CEO who thought he was king of his own domain. One of my favorite stories is uh, all of our ad inventory at the time, we, the mail, I call it mail inventory, which is actually not proper, but yeah, all of our integrated A&D was the name of the company, inventory, ad inventory, was being dumped on ad exchanges because no CEO had enough inventory to make a segment. So they would just sell it at pennies on the dollar. So the guys at Glam and some of the other big ad, ad networks were buying our inventory at pennies on the dollar and reselling it for dollars. And so I banned the sale of inventory on exchanges, which everyone freaked out. They're like, I can't make my numbers. You're going to make me mess my quarter. And I said, yeah, that's fine. You can buy, you can borrow money from me you know, and bank at this interest rate and you can fill your segments by buying inventory from those same exchanges but you cannot sell to them without my permission and I'm never giving it. So of course our numbers went crazy because suddenly if you wanted to reach, you know, for instance, women 25 to 45, we were the only way and you had to buy premium. So we went from being bottom of the barrel to premium inventory almost overnight. Based on your experience in, in media, particularly I guess journalism, Yeah. What are your thoughts on the state of journalism today? That's a great question. So it's interesting. If you told me 30 years ago I would consider myself at least a part-time journalist, I would have laughed at you. But working at the BBC, it's like a virus that infects you and you don't even notice it. Like, I'll never forget the, the mobile service. The, the head of editorial and I got in this big debate over what kind of information should be on the homepage of the mobile service. And again, he really wanted it to be the list of things he decided was important, and I wanted it to be the list of things that was relevant to where you were standing. And so there was a big snowstorm. England doesn't get very many snowstorms, but there was a huge snowstorm. And the southern half of the country was blanketed in snow. All the trains are canceled. The north half, where he lived, didn't have any snow. So he and I got in this screaming match on the phone, because I said, listen, for everyone south of the river, their mobile phone was used to tell them that the trains are canceled, because if they're standing on a platform, there's like lives at risk. This is you know, a personal safety issue. And it went all the way to the trust, and I won. <laughs> but what was also fascinating is I started to understand why we, he and I had, you know, had a beer and had a long conversation about it. And what I realized is this battle of sort of, are you here to tell the truth? Or are you here to tell your version of the truth? What is truth? You know, you start to get down a slippery slope and start to realize that journalism is an integral to a democratic society. And the Daily Mail, which is politically the opposite of me, I really saw this where, you know, the mail, because in England there's a weird thing, the BBC has no advertising. So if you are aver only advertising in supportive media, it's newspapers and a small TV network. And so those newspapers are, have a lot of cash, but they also, there's so many of them, it's a very literate society. And so when you say something or you cover something, the way you cover it, who you interview, how you tell the story, when you break the story, can have a massive impact on how people vote, what they think. Um, and it really changed my view globally about the importance of free, uh, free press and free media. And actually, because it's much of it is public funded, at least BBC was, made me really question sort of a straight, direct commercial model for, for media long term. I think that there is a, you need a blended option. You need to have public, public dollar support on popular voices on either side of the political spectrum. Hmm. 
And then that brings us kind of today, like, what do you, what's your view of the state of journalism yeah, at present? I think the biggest journalists right now aren't journalists. The biggest publishing platforms are not journalists. They're, it's Facebook. But it's actually not Facebook, the platform. It's Facebook's algorithm. It's Twitter's algorithm. It's the thing that decides what piece of content goes up or down the priority list. And I worry that these are apolitical or amoral AIs, and people really haven't thought through the impact of this. Um, one of our biggest issues today right now is this question of whether, whether Facebook should moderate commercial political content. Um, and I think it's a really interesting debate, right? So I'm a, you will not find a bigger, more vociferous champion of the First Amendment, our ability to say whatever we want. I want to stand at a street corner and say crazy shit. I should have that freedom, and people can listen or not listen. And I fully agree with that. However, when I say that on Facebook, and money can amplify that message, and I say something false, just if I say this castor oil will cure your cancer, that's a criminal act. And so I think that we have to draw a line between me posting crazy shit on my Facebook feed and a politician posting white supremacist memes, because those are different kinds of messages. And I think that we cannot just take all content from personal expression all the way to paid manipulative political speech and put them in the same bucket and treat them the same way. Just as we have rules in broadcast media, newspapers, television, and all the other channels in the world. Do you have confidence in a lot of the the New York Times, the Washington Post of the world are moving towards a subscription model? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on the <laughs> subscription moving towards, model? They, they had they that before. I, you know, it's funny. This is one of those issues, and if you Google me, you'll find me as a very anti-paywall person. Mm -hmm. I'm still very anti-paywall because I think it's terrible for consumer experience, mm -hmm. but I think the funding model for media is currently very, very broken. And some of, that's to, to, some of that's to blame on the advertising model, which is, I think advertising inherently makes sociopathic media. But it's also because we as people don't value news, we don't value truth. Um, and that's a cultural problem, it's a lot deeper, which is why I mentioned a public option. I'm hoping that the blockchain and technology can help us solve this and begin to reward, you know, to use your attention as a reward system, like basic, a basic attention token, and I've seen 50 companies just like that. But none have really got effective market share yet, but I'm hoping that happens. But until then, we really have to think about how media is funded and what we do with our attention. I actually think it's important to listen to a diverse spectrum of voices and not just the people who agree with you. And that also is something that in today's media is very broken. Today you're working in blockchain. Mm -hmm. What's your passion in this industry? So in this industry, the thing I, I Joe Ito, who's a friend of mine, uh, somewhat controversial right now, said very early on he thought the blockchain was the embodiment of trust in software. And I, I tend to agree with him. But I, I think that's exactly right. And I'm really passionate about blockchain because I think it is one of the fundamental change agents of the 21st century. Um, whether it's about money or around trust or around authentication of honesty or, or trustworthy sources. But I think it's also very nascent. You know? So I always tell people, it's not 1991, it's 1984. <laughs> like We are so early in a sort of allegory to the, the old internet days. People are not even on browsers yet. And we're all talking about how consumers are going to use this. <coughs> My mom is not going to log in to MetaMask and, and move some money around. It's just not going to happen. And so until we have technology that makes it seamless for her, where the blockchain disappears, it's not going to work. <coughs> what are some of the challenges that you face in this industry, personally, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? That's a great question. Um, I think my biggest challenge in life right now, as I as I get older, um, when I was very young, it was, it was and I, because I was so immersed in the technology, it was very easy to keep up and keep tabs on what was interesting and what was happening. As I've gotten older, my diverse my interests are so diverse. I'm interested in the Internet of Things. I'm inter very interested in artificial intelligence, quantum computing. Blockchain is one of the many things I'm paying attention to, but as a society, we want people to focus and, and focus their attention and, and be targeted. And I worry that sometimes that makes me a less interesting and less insightful person the more I narrowly focus my, my spectrum of work and thought. What's next for Transform Group? Well, Transform Group is uh, my friend Michael Turpin. Uh, I always joke he's, he's one of the reasons I paid attention to blockchain when I probably would have ignored it in some of the critical times. Uh, he's suing AT&T, as you know, for quite a bit of money for what I think are some pretty bad actions around uh, uh, management of security and privacy. And he asked me if I would come help him with Transform. Um, I joined the business a few months ago and really 
a cost and conglomerate because we have an events business, we have a PR and communications business, we have a strategy business. Uh, we're thinking about getting into investment banking, although we haven't done that yet. We have an angel investment network. We have so many, we have a wire service, we have so many different interesting businesses, and today most of those businesses, their primary sector is blockchain. And so we're thinking about both what services should we have, should we grow into, should we expand beyond blockchain into transformative technologies, and also like, what does the world look like three years, five years, ten years from now? I mean, as it is today, if you look at the top hundred tokens in the, in the market cap of, block, of cryptocurrency, you know, we've represented 60, 70 percent of those companies uh, at one time or another. I mean, we really do touch the most important companies in the space. And so that's a really exciting thing. But I, I'm really focused on the one year, five year, ten year plan. And what as a business can we do to really grow past the rails of sort of one sector of, of activity and technology? Great. Anything else coming up for Transform? Uh, well, Coin Agenda is this week. Uh, we'll have one again in the spring. Uh, we're actually in the process of growing. I mentioned our angel network. Um, something that's very close to my heart, Bit Angels. Mm -hmm. And so I'm an angel investor. I've been an angel investor for a long time. I think the connection between serial entrepreneurs and early stage founders is a really critical thing. And many angel groups exist, but they tend to focus, they tend to be sort of different kinds of companies, um, more practical businesses. And so years ago, Michael Turpin and a few partners formed something called Bit Angels. Uh, it's a network of cities. I think we're targeting 20 cities by end of year. Um, they meet once a month. You see blockchain companies. One of us comes and talks sometime. We have expert speakers. And then you see a curated set of companies who are raising money, and you can invest in those companies or learn about the industry. Um, and the one I held, I, I keynoted the one in Toronto a few weeks ago, and it was just a phenomenal experience. There was more than 100 people there in the audience, you know, looking at these companies. The companies were fantastic. So I think we are on that sort of, we've done the J-curve, the trough of despair, and we're now on the way back up for building real successful businesses. And my hope is that Bit Angels can help put a rocket ship under that cycle of, of growth and development. Great. Well, Richard Titus, thanks for sitting down with us today at Coin Agenda 2019. Thank you very much.